All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, for the people remote, uh, we're just waiting for a few others to show up here in the room. So hang tight, and we'll start in a couple minutes.
All right, I think we are ready to get started. Uh, thanks everyone who's joining here in the room and also remotely. Um, good to see everyone. So this is our uh, EDM IAB program. So it, we're, where it's where we talk about evolvability, deployability, and maintainability. This is not an ITF working group. It's not a research group. Um, instead, this is a function that the IAB, the Internet Architecture Board, um, uh, has to have uh, discussions with the community and experts um, and try to you know, have just an open discussion and understand you know, what we can uh, l learn about uh, some of these topics. And we've come out with some good RFCs from this group. And we have a couple documents that we are talking about today and some new uh, discussion. So before we get started, uh, this is the note well. You've seen it before, I'm sure, but it does apply to stuff that's going on in this room as well. So please take that into consideration. You can do it. As a reminder, everyone agreed to the note well when they registered to this event. Uh, took plenty of things in there. Just want to highlight our code of conduct, which the chairs will be enforcing. These are topics that are fun, and let's have a good time. OK. Um, so. We don't have a lot of formal slides. This is going to be just a discussion, but there are a couple of topics that we have. Um, since last time when we uh, had a virtual meeting, uh, Lucas very kindly wrote up a document on protocol greasing that uh, is based on kind of the, the, the notes and outlines of things that we thought should be included in a document uh, that we are working on for this program. We also want to update from Charles on his fine code draft, which I think was talked about in Gen Dispatch. And then uh, Chris brought up that he has a topic on deprecation. So we'll just leave that ominously on the table. Um, all right. So Lucas, do you want to just you know, in introduce us to <coughs> what you wrote up in greasing? I don't know. I mean, if you want to share a screen or just like, you know, look at the document or... I encourage people, if you haven't already read what Lucas put out, uh, you know, do pull this up and have a quick skim over it. Hey, yep, yeah, Lucas. Um, I'm going to try to do my slides for the next session rather than this one. So yeah, I have we don't need slides. <laughs> um, so yeah, th this is effectively uh, trying just to capture and, and reflect the things we discussed at, at you know, early morning in Yokohama last time around um, and then we had an interim meeting as well uh, which which was a big help too so having kind of taken the the task of a pen holder um, last time uh, I, I went away to, to, to sit on these things you know the, the topics are close to my um, interests but uh, it felt there was a period of time where I felt a, a piece of writer's block that we have some documents that speak to these concepts but that just writing a, a, an ID that points to three other things and says job done didn't seem very useful. Well, that's where the, the interim meeting um, was great because I actually identified the kind of gaps or the reframing or the, the generalization of concepts that we would like to do. So um, I'm just trying to, uh, I don't know I, if I can share the screen. Um, <laughs> multitask is very hard for me right now. Great. So, um, yeah, feel free to request. Uh, I'm not even logged in. I apologize. That's fine. Um, so I guess while we're doing that, uh, who, who's had a chance to read through that? Scanning right now. Love it. Love it. That is often how I read documents in meetings, too, I am ashamed to say. <laughs> I'll never admit that. <laughs> 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 I'm almost there. That's fine.
Is it working? I think it's ah, just about to come through. Go. Okay, cool. thank you for your patience, Val. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can full screen this. Nope, that's dev tools. Okay. So I think maybe just looking at the, the document structure and the outline. Uh, can you make it bigger? It's short. Good job, good job. And I think the first thing for me is, you know, we came up with a, a funny acronym last time around um, and trying to kind of backronize that into something and uh, naming it kind of just distracted me too. So I thought I'd just throw that away. You can always rename this thing if you want, but effectively capture very linearly effectively what we discussed in the interim and then kind of work backwards from there for the document title. But yeah, it's, I, I'd say if, if the folks have read it, it's not terribly complicated. Um, and, and we're trying to fill it out. I've pulled examples of these concepts like greasing and protocol variability um, and, and try to use some examples to illustrate those based on what I know. But I don't think that's exhaustive in any, in any pure sense. So while I've been here, I've tried to, to speak to other folks. Maybe they have some, uh, but those also tend to just to be focused on the quick protocol too because of the kinds of folks I hang out with. Um, and maybe there's a danger there that if all of the examples are just quick, then it's more of a treatise on the quick, and, and that's not what we're looking for. Uh, and maybe there's too many examples. Maybe the concepts we're talking about are, are illustrated with one, and that's fine. We, and we have examples of this, say, with other IAB documents I'm familiar with, that mm -hmm. maybe just use one example based on HTTP to, to try and discuss this stuff. So that's, that'd be the kind of input I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. How much is too much? Is there anything we're missing? Um, this, this section four on protocol variability, I don't like the name, but again, this is kind of where we uh, uh, struggled. You know, it's, it's not it's technically protocol fuzzing. You know, it's not those concepts of trying to purposefully just iterate with random data, looking for hard edges, but to, you know, exercise the protocol. And I think this, it, it, there was even a bug report this week that maybe, um, the uh, in in the the quiche implementation of quick that um, I work to we have the idea of grease grease frames in HTTP three that are ignored and we do and that works and that has worked for a while but that the sequencing of those grease frames within the concept of a HTTP message um, things might break it even though we thought we had good Ooh. coverage and so again that's a sequencing and variability. Thing. And it could be actually that that is banned, even though you should do something. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into the weeds there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, there's not much to say other than the kind of done the first draft, even though it says draft two. You know, those are kind of edits of the title or whatever. Um, so I'm really looking for more for more input. And if anyone did want to come on board and co-author and kind of help out. Dave, are you in the queue? Um, I am in the queue. Um, Go ahead. So in my skim, the one thing that I wanted to comment on is in some <coughs> considerations where it talks about uh, you know, fingerprinting and a deeper analysis of this topic has been deemed out of scope, um, which I think is fine, by the way. Um, my question is, is there something we can reference? And so first, the question I want hmm. people to think about is, is there already a document about fingerprinting? And if not, should there be one? And then it occurred to me that the closest thing that I'm aware of is the IAB RFC, which mm -hmm. is 6973, which is the privacy considerations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it does thinking. mention fingerprinting in there. It's not a very detailed discussion. And so if nothing else, I'd suggest adding that as an informative reference from that section right now. Uh, on fingerprinting in general, I'm, I'm, I'm saying not for a particular protocol or whatever, but just the concept of fingerprinting and the, as a general attack stuff. And so 6973 is the only one that I'm aware of that touches on it. And there's only, at most two paragraphs in there, right? Maybe less, right? Um, but I yeah. at least add that as an informative reference. Uh, yeah, thank, thank thanks you. for the reminder for that. Um, that was kind of based on my, my read of the room last time around. And I, Chris Wood, I, I, I can't recall if you were not present in that meeting and we kind of we're trading notes about what to write about. And I'd said that and your, your kind of uh, ears peaked up like, well, well, why not? So I don't know, Chris, if, if maybe 
you have any anything to add there? Um, happy to try and propose text to flush this out. Okay, I guess the, the question for me is 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 this the kind of you know how much how much do we want to say here without distracting the whole discussion? There's value in in these concepts and ideas and concerns about fingerprinting is definitely valid, but uh, you know there's only so much time and and, and focus we can do. I don't want this to turn into like the, the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, we can finesse it and, and find the right balance. I'm not too worried about that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, uh, Gore. Hi. Um, most of the words we have appear to relate to quick, which is in an encrypted envelope. So do we want to say anything about protocols which are not encrypted because then the greasing is very visible? And do we have examples of that? Because it's probably equally viable, but I'm not sure where to go in that. So it's just throwing it out there as a question. I think do we know of examples that are not encrypted. Do we know of examples that use greasing? Because <laughs> you could talk about, you know, greasing V6 extension header space or something like that. Yeah, we don't know. And maybe we should have done that, but yes. That's my point exactly, right? If you say, well, here's an example of where we didn't do it, where we could have, and here's what happened as a result, right? Even that's a learning, right? Okay. 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 So we shouldn't draw a conclusion that if we'd done that, then this would have been the answer. But we can say, this is what happened. We didn't grease it. We could have greased it. So an, an interesting f fact here of um, one of the, uh, actually, the thing that's, the paragraph that's on the screen that Lucas has here is a part of Quick. Um, amusingly, I, if I'm reading through between the lines, Lucas, you're referencing the feature I added to client hellos, right? So this was a unencrypted part of Quick that middle boxes were reading incorrectly and tripping over. So we did this thing where we just moved everything around to force them to implement a real Quick stack as opposed to look for things that are fixed offset in the packet. And so I think that that's an example where clearly I knew that the other endpoint that was participating in the connection wouldn't really benefit from this because if you didn't implement stream assembly, things would break horribly at some point or another. But this was specifically outside of the encrypted envelope. But maybe it's worth mentioning that. Yeah, that sounds completely reasonable. Um, I guess the other question I've got is is how much is like plain text is plain text. So there's there's the plain text you can manipulate and nobody can detect that easily. And then there's the plain text that has some more in integrity to it, which uh, isn't manipulated, manipulated, uh, but uh, that can cause things within the path to break. That uh, because you know they have expectations of behavior and, and, and those things didn't exist. So I'm struggling to think of examples there. But I wonder if there's things outside my normal wheelhouse that this could apply to, like the DNS or BGP or things where you have like I don't know things that are more like strings that you stick characters in and they break. Um, I can't remember if we talked about the ALPN example mm. um, last time that, you know, people, it looks like a string and people try to treat it like a string and it's not, it's a, string not a string and that causes like some things to break. Oh, but only when you try to print them out, you know, like <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so I'm next in queue here. So I, I definitely agree with the desire to have more diverse examples from stuff beyond quick. And so we should you know, solicit that from people in this room and other rooms. Um, it, but potentially a step before that, both for uh, aiding that effort as well as the readability. You know, one thing that occurs to me kind of looking through this is that we, we could benefit from a bit more you know, structure and sub points um, to really pull out the the bits that are like here is a particular consideration um, as like a little subsection or make it more clear because right now we kind of have like the examples and everything all you know, mashed into a rather long uh, paragraphs here and you know I think there are some good salient points about you know okay here's 
you know, we have a little subsection where like, here's what you should do for like the IANA registry considerations when you are adding this. And here's what you should do for this and like make sure that you uh, are not actually validating that they're grease things upon receipt and like other things. So just you know, have a, the quick bullet list of like, here's our advice points. And then here's the illustrative examples uh, that back them up. And I think once we pull that out, then, you know, it'd be very easy to kind of sh shop around like, hey, here are these points, you know, various protocols, you know, how does this apply to you? And then they can fill in their examples. Yep, that sounds reasonable. Would, would you, you kind of put that towards the start of the document and then reference down with examples about kind of explain or justify yeah, why or I think you could have the examples in line. I mean, that's more of an editorial thing, but okay. uh, just you know, re really they kind of like pull out these points and just make it easy to, as you know, as someone is skimming to like understand what's the, sure. the high level details here. Um, then also out of curiosity, uh, you mentioned your issue in quiche with the variability. Could you, could you expand on that? Um, is there something we can learn from what may be going wrong in receiving the grease? Um, it depends how, how much time I've got and how much in the weeds we want to get to. I can I can try and explain it in a high level, and then sure. and if it doesn't make any sense, we'll go just to see if we can learn. We'll keep doing inception. This. So um, for those who may or may not be familiar with HTTP, uh, we have a, a kind of separation of semantics to syntax. The the idea of logical request response messages and the interaction between a client and a server that get sent, and then there's how those get serialized onto the wire. So we can take quick out of the picture here and just consider HTTP requests that consists of metadata, headers, and then uh, optional body or content. Um, and those things get sent in uh, different frames. A headers frame uh, can contain effectively all of the metadata, albeit its representation is compressed and we can ignore that for now. But you, you would, as a client, send one headers frame and then multiple data frames because potentially the content could be very large and bigger than uh, an MTU or, or whatever vesicle you care about right there. Um, and then you would effectively close the stream, maybe. Um, uh, and, and that's a signal that the, the request had finished. And then the, the response effectively has the same uh, behavior in the background. And this is defined in a HTTP3 spec, RFC 9114, uh, effectively the message interchange rules about sequencing of those frames. If you received a, the body before the metadata, well, that's a break in the semantics. It doesn't make sense. It's an error in the syntax. And HTTP3 explains very clearly what to do in those circumstances. There, there is a, a statement that you, you know other frames can appear within that sequence and that interaction and that they may or may not be safe. Generally, if they're grease frames, they don't have a meaning and they should be ignored and that all works okay. Um, if they were something like an extension there, then they wouldn't. And so you have this other thing of, of trailing metadata that could appear after a data frame, but then you, you, know, you, you can send headers, data, headers. You can't send headers, data, headers, data. It, you, you just get into this, Fairly simple state machine. And so, you know, what you end up with there is like people would need to send grease in some cases and, and not others. Usually it's easier to just send it at the start rather than the tail. But this is sort of kind of variability aspect that maybe greasing should go in, in between here and there. But it's kind of annoying if you have as a receiver, you know, like you want to pause until the end of the stream and expect like, just to read all of the data out and done and go. Having to kind of hang around while somebody sends you this grease frame while you wait for the, the finishes is annoying, but it's completely legit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe that's the reason why people don't do it because it's annoying. It's not because the protocol can't, but they just didn't think to do it. Um, but in, in this case, we think that there is a client that's trying that and, and it's fine. We think, but then I need to go back to the RFC and make sure that that sequence is actually correct. And sometimes those things are, are a bit of a uh, not disagreement, but a, uh, it, it gets so complicated. Are well, you probably not uh, following along because I'm rambling? And then he's got oh, whatever. Um, I'll just move on, and I'll do a more interesting thing. 
Uh, but for me, this is like something that would be really easy to test, right? And just write some kind of testing uh, environment. We did well with the quick interop runner during um, development of the quick RFCs, but the HV3 tests there, I think there's one compared to, I don't know, Martin, if you can remember how many tests are in currently in the interop runner for quick stuff. Um, 20. So, you know, um, there's more work we do there, but quick is a transport protocol. It's not just HB3. So whose responsibility should that be? The HB working group? Well, we're busy there too. So we've talked um, uh, in, in other meetings in that realm about wanting to do better testing, um, coming up with corpus of not, you know, fuzz data, but corpus of test cases. Because that, that's, that's the annoying thing, developing the test case it's time consuming running the test case or the developing the kind of test runners and infrastructure is, is generally a lot easier. And there's something there that most implementations have. Uh, and what can we do? Who, who can kind of help those efforts? So uh, it's not, this problem isn't like completely brand new and unexpected, but um, I haven't, I just didn't want to spend infinite cycles thinking of every permutation of a thing that could possibly maybe happen. And, and, guess what, somebody might then invent an extension frame that has some additional sequencing rules and you have to go and modulate all of the other stuff you've already done and kind of keep creating these multi-dimensional problems. I don't think that is a real example, but we do have these things We're looking at like uh, settings and, and do settings advertise. So HP2 has the settings that, that get exchanged at the start of the connection that give uh, properties of the connection itself and they can extend the, the, the HP behavior in, in very breaking ways, and the peers need to agree on that. And then if, if they do, but then you don't understand the setting and you ignore it, well, uh, yeah, I just, this, this stuff keeps me awake at night. And uh, maybe some of that can come in here and be done in a salient bullet point, and uh, maybe, maybe it can't, and what we can do is try and create a, a I don't wanna say, but like a taxonomy of these kinds of problems and, and maybe we need to capture in a bullet point that actually we don't have a recommendation here. I, I, you know, think of that and how to solve it best within your domain mm -hmm. of, of expertise or skill. Dave, do you want to jump in? Mike, I'm going to set a different topic. Are you going to say more? Um, yeah, I was just going to respond to that. Respond yeah. To that I, I was just going to say, because you know, I was trying to figure, you know, what can we learn from this? Is there something useful to put in here? The the main point, at least I got from that, is the the realization that you know we are most likely to grease in the ways that are easy and convenient, but that is not necessarily the way the the place that's going to be most effective for what future protocols and protocol extensions are going to need. Uh, so maybe, you know, just having a, a note in here of, you know, it's like the variability, you know, don't just put the, the grease or the extra things in the most obvious place. Like don't do them just always at the beginning so you can get it out of the way and say, oh, I did it. I feel good about myself now. Um, that, yeah. And, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And as developers and people testing, it's easy to be lazy like that. And I think maybe a way to phrase it is in terms of overhead, you know, there's a, a like an admin slash operational overhead for these things. But there's, depending on what you're trying to do, there's, and you're trying to effectively add protocol variability for live connections that, and, and, and those should run forever for the perpetuity of, of however long you're using those protocols. There's, there can be overheads here. And I'm thinking of um, an example that Martin Seaman has uh, where uh, the, he exercises the key update mechanism of Quick, which can, be, you know, have, have some overheads, but maybe not that bad. I don't know, Martin, if you want to, you want to speak to that example, or would you like me to try and give, explain it in a bad way? So the key updates is a, a kind of obscure feature in the, in the uh, quick, um, quick RFC, um, saying that after sending a, a certain number of packets and this number is, is pretty high, so you, you won't hit it um, under, under a lot of circumstances. Um, you need to update your keys, otherwise um, you risk um, 
leaking some 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 bits about your key. Um, and since this is not hit by the vast majority of connections, um, some implementations decided to uh, implement this feature later and to, to ship quick first. And I can't really blame them for that. Um, other implementations um, like my own stack were like very aggressive initiating this key update because uh, while well, I saw this in the spec, I was like, okay, this is this is not getting exercised a lot. If I if I don't if I don't force it, um, there will probably be bugs, um, either in my implementation or in the other implementation. So I I, I initiated initiated the first key update after like a hundred thousand packets or something, uh, like really early in the connection. Um, and then I started getting the bug reports like, oh, your stack fails with like um, this this big CDNs um, um, uh, quick implementation. Can, can 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 you fix your stack? And um, I've 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 had this discussion a lot of times because a lot of people ran into this issue and and it got it got really annoying. But then you know that comes to the how how soon within a connection would you exercise the thing? And then, you know, how once you do, how often then should you keep doing it? Is it enough to try one key update in the connection uh, and do that on the first packet or to do it at the tail end or keep keep going? And I think you had you had an approach for, for that, like now, say, of like do it after 100 packets, but don't do it every 100 packets, do it then maybe once more it, within some realistic... I know stochastic analysis of how long connections last versus where they're running and then et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Yeah, the, the problem there was that that my stack was really not the best way to to force the ecosystem to um, to implement this change. Like this, this had gone would have gone very differently had Chrome decided to to um, um, to do the key update after hundred packets, right? Then no, no CDN would have been in a position to say, like, oh, we don't care about interrupted Chrome. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and so I wonder if there's there's something in that that the effectiveness of these methods depend upon the uh, the market and how, how people respond to failures of those kinds. Yes, we all want to do everything correctly 100% of the time, but uh, in, a, in a consistency of priorities where we don't have infinite effort um, and then there's non-technical things that uh, are at play there. Yep, definitely. And we can take note of that. All right, Dave, let's go over to you. Switch topics. Okay, um, so a uh, different topic as I was skimming and then I went to RFC 9173.3, the other uh, EDM document that has the greasing section. Um, and I was thinking about the issue of uh, what happens if greased values don't make it all the way through. Because this is, again, the case where you're not doing encrypted end to end, like V6 extension headers and so on. So I was still thinking through that, right? Um, and the, and try to decide, is there actually a good discussion? And the conclusion that I have is no, but there should be a good discussion in this one. There is a discussion. The closest thing that I could find is the statement in 9170 that says uh, this and the rest of the stuff that it's talking about depends largely on the assumption that the difficulty of, ex of implementing the extension mechanism correctly is as easier, easier than implementing code to identify and filter out reserved values. Okay. Well, lots of middle boxes have whitelists, right? You think about, you know, ICMP, Eric, you know, ICMP messages and so on says, well, they could implement all extensions just by dropping them, right? If you're a middle box and it's, uh, and it's not encrypted end to end. And so I'm wondering if there should actually be some section that discusses some considerations about such things. And so here's some examples of questions that one might answer or at least raise, okay? Um, one is, um, should the receiver, uh, meaning the, the correct receiver, right, detect and log or whatever else the lack of receiving greasing messages? Okay, meaning obviously some middle box is filtering them out. Is that something that's good to detect and log or what would you do with them? Another interesting question, protocol design, is if you're building an end-to-end -end protocol, um, should you build in a greasing failure detection mechanism? So for example, could you, you can imagine a protocol that says, I'm going to uh, have a timeout and the connection will go down if I don't act the fact that it's being greased of you know, 10 minutes or whatever it is, some long period or whatever. Is that a good protocol design or a bad protocol design? That's a question, okay? 
having a discussion of such things would actually help implementers and help protocol designers, I think, especially when you have this case of non-encrypted end-to-end -end cases like you know, the extension header example. Thank you, that's a good point. So just to respond directly to that, is that um, something you would be willing to contribute uh, as a issue or pull request to the, the document and add some text and volunteer to do some of that? Maybe, but not during the next two months. Okay. <laughs> But if you ask me again in September, the answer might be yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, that, that is true. Now I'm going to go and find the GitHub repository. Uh, gee, I can read the repository. Chris, do you want to go? Yeah, I had a question about the scope of the document. Um, uh, as the names or, or the acronym sort of grease suggests, this is about like greasing extension points in, in protocols. Um, what we've seen in uh, other other protocols, um, greasing in different ways. So the the example that came up earlier this week is in Privacy Pass, where um, uh, a an implementation may choose to uh, arbitrarily uh, uh, like support or uh, do a feature or not do a feature, like run Privacy Pass or not run Privacy Pass effectively. Um, and in, in my mind, that's like effectively a form of greasing. Um, uh, it's, it's not an extension point. It's like just selectively, uh, de deciding whether or not to, to run protocol X or not. And I'm wondering if, uh, the, this, that is something we should talk about in the scope of this document, or if that's, uh, not relevant out of scope to be done elsewhere. I mean, it sounds like Yoda to me, you know, do or do not, but don't, don't try just do the thing or make your mind up. But I, I don't have the context of privacy pass is, again, I'll, I'll ask the question, is that something you can create an issue and or frame some text? So maybe we could discuss around that text. Uh, sure. Um, I guess. Uh, to, to, to Guys, be... I don't know which one of you it is, but stop touching the microphone. It's That's causing the clicking sounds. <laughs> um, so concretely, the way it works is in Privacy Pass, the server says, like, give me a token. And then the client uh, flips a coin and then decides whether or not to reply with the token or not. That, that is effectively, in my mind, a form of greasing. And um, so we, we can say something about this or not. Um, and I'm happy to try to like craft text um, uh, to do it. Or if I don't craft text, I'm not doing it. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, though, if like, this is like totally off base or if this is something that would be interesting to, to talk about. I mean, is this just kind of like one of the forms or points in variability that you know, besides ordering, there's just like, do I do the feature or not? It might be, yeah. That it might be the way you fold it in. Yeah, and and and, and that to me, I, I'll go in and try and get a better picture. But um, you know, is is that how we kind of do the spin bit? You know, you know, it's a bit you can turn on and off. But we say. Uh, for the purposes of uh, ensuring that middle boxes don't start assuming all connections in the planet are using Spinbit, uh, they, you should like dead, carve out some proportion that never would. So, and that wasn't like keep flipping a coin and, and let those stats come out. But thirty percent of my connections, I'm going to do this thing. Right. I, I think the Spinbit is very similar to this. Of like, we don't want the entire ecosystem to assume support for this feature. And therefore, we need to not always do it. Um, it's similar, but the difference in my mind is this bit is like part of the quick protocol, whereas the, the, the scope of the feature here is like the entire protocol. Like, do I run quick or not run quick? Do I run privacy pass or not run privacy pass? Um, that might not be like a useful distinction, but that is a difference. I, I, I think it is the same if you don't look at the protocol as being privacy pass, but the protocol being you know, the web, like, you know, how we use HTTP on the web. And there are features essentially that are more or less kind of baked in, like these are table stakes to be able to work. And we can essentially, we're choosing, we don't want this particular protocol extension to later become necessary in order to use the rest of the protocol. So we need to make sure we don't always use it. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess, I, I'll file an issue, cannot promise I provide text or whatever, um, but it, it could be useful to talk about. Yeah, I think I 
I think that's good. And just to respond quickly, I th you know, we I would say you could extend this even further and be like, well, we've got HB3 and, and you advertise that and the, the endpoint decides if it should use it or not based on its understanding of things and whatever. Some of that is implementation specific. Some of it is in the specs. Like if you see this thing, you should use it. But are we saying, well, for the health of the internet, we should always make sure all the endpoints support HB1 and HB2 forever and that we, we're still going to expect some proportion of traffic to use this just to exercise TCP flows for these kinds of request response exchanges because otherwise think bad things could happen. To me, that doesn't sound right, but I think it would be interesting to, to explore that a bit more. Right. I was trying to come back on Dave. Dave. So um, you talked about two different things. One was logging stuff when it didn't happen always must, must be worth considering. The same way you talk about actually breaking the connection because it didn't happen. And then I thought about which layer are we at? If we set multiple layers, this becomes a little bit hard to manage. If we, a lot of the discussion around the room was about like things high up that actually had connectivity. And if we do this at network layer and shim layers in between, then this becomes a rather difficult thing or different thing. I just wondered what the thoughts were on that. Um. The, the thought is that it would be good to whatever the discussion is to say something in the document, uh, but that's the meta point. Um, and what you might say, um, you know, any layer that has uh, that is um, end to end, meaning it goes more than one hop, right? Um, and you could even argue that you know maybe um, things like uh, neighbor discovery go more than one hop when you have layer two switches and stuff in there, right? And so I, when I say multiple hops, right, I don't mean multiple layer three hops, but you know, it is a switch a layer three hop? Well, you know, unfortunately, sometimes yes, right? Um, and so anytime that you can have an ACK mechanism built in, right? And so you can argue whether that IPv6 did that, but it's not very effective because the ACK mechanism is ICMP errors, right? Um, so could you, uh, so it tried to, right? It may not be very effective, but the point is anytime that you have an end-to-end, -end, uh, the way to send an end-to-end -end message, not necessarily a session, but if you have a way to send, get a message through, then saying lack of receiving such of a message might be cause for saying there is a problem in the middle and just pretend, let's pretend hypothetically that, if we, that when IPv6 was first designed, it said, if you didn't get an ICMP ACK back that uh, you had to reroute. Would we end up with a different ecosystem of middle boxes? You'd end up with different behavior, right? Would you end up with a different problem? I don't know, but I'm saying you can imagine different ways to design protocols, right? At different layers is my point. So, and, and whether that's good or bad, I'm just saying we should discuss to say, well, it might be good. Here's some considerations or things to keep in mind. Um, okay, let's think about these things. Yeah. 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 Uh, and since I had the mic, um, I couldn't find the GitHub repository because it's not linked to the draft in the data tracker. So if somebody can send it to me in the chat, that'd be great. And link it in the data tracker. There's a link right in the draft. In the draft itself. Okay. Yeah. Apparently I didn't we read every word in the, the draft, data right? But uh, yeah, it'd be great to link it into the data tracker, right? Cool. That would be great. Cool. All right. Um, I think that was a pretty good coverage. Anything else anyone wants to say on this or shall we move on to our next items? All right. Yeah, thanks everyone for jumping in. This was a really good conversation. Uh, please, for everyone who had these good ideas, the chairs will like try to loop back, but if you can never file an issue in your own words to describe them, I think that'll help Lucas out quite a bit. Uh, yeah, even if it's short, that way we keep, we don't forget about them. Yes. Lucas is pointing at his, at his coffee mug. I feel you, Lucas. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Charles, do you want to talk a little bit? Um, and if you want to share slides, go for it. Oh. Yeah. OK, so uh, yeah, I think uh, let me try without sharing slides. Um, no, well, first of all, maybe just how many people here were in the Gen Dispatch uh, session? Just so I kind of get an idea if most people. Some, okay. Yeah, like so, three of us. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the draft, uh, I guess in summary, it's about making it easier to, to find code related to internet drafts and RFCs. And I've presented it and we've talked about it a few times in this group before. And 
the thought was, well, okay, it seems to be going pretty well, but what to do next in terms of uh, progressing it or, or uh, figuring out an answer to that question? Because we decided it wasn't necessarily this within the scope of this group or the IAB um, to work on it. So I, I did bring it into Gen Dispatch um, for a number of reasons. I feel like I didn't maybe didn't represent it real well because I think I was concerned about the the larger discussion about uh, AD uh, workloads and how to reduce that. And I, I just got the sense we were running out of time and everyone really wanted to focus on that. So um, I tried to go quickly. There was a, uh, didn't really get a good resolution out of that. I'd say the feedback I, I recall from the room was mostly um, positive in terms of the approach, but that um, the only real um, uh, suggestion as to how to dispatch uh, was along the lines of, well, maybe we don't need anything, we're actually done. Uh, and we don't need to progress this as a BCP. And uh, while I don't agree with that, I think that's that's arguably a, a path we could take. Um, I thought about it some more and I think to me, you could make that statement about just about any draft we have, right? If it starts to get some adoption, even the greasing, you know, people agree, oh, this is a good idea. But at some point you want it to seem like you got some consensus within whatever group, if it's the IETF consensus, which I think we were thinking was a good way to go here. So um, for that to happen, I still think it makes sense to publish it as a, a BCP. And, uh, but I don't know how to kind of make, I mean, so I obviously have a different opinion than, than Martin. And uh, I think Miria got up and she kind of said she thought it made sense to take it forward, but uh, it's not clear that there's a, a home for it yet, or at least we certainly didn't reach a conclusion as to where to, to bring it. So I'm happy to keep you know, working on the draft and updating it um, and hopefully get some more comments um, as to things that can be improved. And I didn't get any feedback really other than I think uh, one change perhaps is to um, add some text in the draft that mentions the related implementations if, if, they, if they have been uh, called out. So that's not just in the data tracker, it's in the, the draft. So that seemed like a good thing. So I plan to do that. But in terms of, you know, next steps other than that, um, I'm not really too sure. Uh, so happy to uh, have some discussion here and see what people think. So I don't have a strong opinion here. I think there's value in both the points that Martin and Miria made yesterday. Um, on one hand, like my gut feeling is that the an RFC is not necessarily the right place because RFCs are immutable, and this might be the kind of thing where you know, oh, we switch from GitHub to GitLab, for example, and so like a wiki page might be better. Uh, that said, well, you know, if I could boil the um, immutable RFC ocean, I would do that, but um, it might. I, I totally understand wanting this to be, you know, saved in the RFC series for posterity. Um, we've kind of exhausted a lot of our avenues for that in, in, in sense that like, there, you know, there wasn't really a specific group and we decided not to go with an IIB document and we, there was no idea who was willing to sponsor it. Have you talked to the ISC? Um, no, I, I haven't. Um, also in terms of AD sponsorship, um, I wasn't sure if there wasn't an AD that wanted to sponsor it, or rather we thought, why do that when bringing it to Gen Dispatch is maybe more appropriate than AD sponsorship, but we could still visit like, hey, if Gen Dispatch, like if the consensus was not to run it through uh, as a, you know, an I IETF, say working group process, then maybe AD sponsorship is an alternative. I'm not saying that's the way I want to go, but that might be worth revisiting uh, before going to the uh, independent stream. I agree with that. That's a good idea. Yeah, the, and the other thought that comes to mind is, you know, fundamentally what's important here is just, you know, how easy it is for people to find code rather than how we write about it. Um, and, you know, potentially it is easier to progress a BCP. Mm 
when everyone has like kind of like done more of like is actually using all of the tools that we want. So, you know, separate to writing a document is, is there more we can do? And you, you already do this as part of hackathon and stuff, you know, as far as just like, you know, being in the community and evangelizing things, but to just have, you know, concerted efforts and strategies and talking to working group chairs and other things about like, let's improve the way that we're handling finding code and doing interoperability and tracking these things. Um, because, you know, like as a program, like our output doesn't have to be just documents. It can, it can also be, you know, just activity in the community. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's something we can think about also for, you know, next time in Prague or whatever. And like, trying to have like a concerted effort and strategy of you know, how do we, because we, we've sent things to working group chairs lists and I know you've talked about things at Hackathon, but um, tr trying to have a, a clear message of these are, we think this will be useful for the community and repeating that message in many different venues um, outside of the scope of a document. Um, one other thought is my focus, and I think the thing that, that most people have focused on is, hey, there's this related implementations tag in Data Tracker. Go set it to something. Um, and, and, and then I've been counting like the number of times people do that. So that's kind of the, the main thing everyone thinks of. There's some other stuff in there about, you know, um, setting up a GitHub repo and putting things in a readme. And I don't know how much people are really thinking about that and doing that and if what is there if they if there's um, more uh, more precision or <laughs> that that would be helpful as to how to do it or if actually some of that stuff is overkill and, and not needed and it's just like you know something <laughs> it's really just the related implementations tag so thinking about that is also the other thing is is there a, a larger problem where we want to have a little bit more guidance on the whole end to end thing or if it's really just related implementations then Let's just figure maybe there's a way to document that feature in the data tracker and point people to it. Um, so I, I tend to think there's some value in kind of the larger scope of, you know, the GitHub part, the README, and and then having a, a process through this rather than lots of different ways of doing it. Um, but that that was kind of my original goal with with writing this. So I think that that to me is how we feel about that kind of determines whether it's a BCP or it's just a feature of the data track. Uh, my comment is not about the draft uh, itself, um, but about the, the tooling and stuff. I mean, I love the uh, related implementations and use it for things that I'm both the author and the working group share for. Um, and I know it's been discussed a couple of times in like the working group share lunch and so on, uh, where we keep, uh, uh, giving visibility to it, but I don't know how widely used it is across other working groups, but it seems to me that would be straightforward, maybe not easy, but straightforward to have a tool that uh, says for every working group, for every draft in the working group, whether there's related implementations and give a metric for working groups, you can see, ah, these working groups are the ones that are using it, these ones are not using it, these are the ones that maybe started using it and could be, and so it gives us a way to actually rate how well we're doing and encouraging people to use it. Yeah, and I, I agree with that, and that's something that I think I I'm kind of interested to work on as a, it's probably more of a code sprint pro yeah, project yeah, than a hackathon exactly. project, but so far the way it's worked is um, uh, complicated Python queries on the command, like uh, just Python request that queries the database and spits out answers and you refine it to get what you want. So it's mm -hmm. a kind of a one-time, hey, we know how to figure this out, but yeah. to get, get it, yeah displayed in a way that's consumable. I, I would uh, love to see like a cool. one slide color coded display shown in the working group series yeah. meeting says, here's those of you that are using it and here's those of you that aren't. And if you aren't, you know, we're talking to you now as to why you should and good job to those who are green yeah. on the list, whatever, so. That sounds like a, a good next step. Yeah, thanks. So Charles, a very quick positive feedback. Um, we had um, a draft I was discussing with people and we discovered 
um, that there was a dissector in Wireshark for, for it, which is a useful tool. It's not an implementation, but it's a useful tool. In fact, so useful that when we got to the final stage of the draft, we discovered that the dissector was what everyone had tested against, and the iron registry had now had to be updated to reflect what people have really been using, <laughs> because they used what was in Wireshark, which is the one we discussed earlier. So having a point, a tool uh, for dissecting or viewing or decoding or whatever it is, is such a good thing that maybe we should separately emphasize that to the implementation itself. That is a good point in the draft. Yeah, yeah um, I, I tried to, you know, make it clear that, you know, those types of things are important too, and and are examples of related implementations that doesn't have to be so, but it, it can be made more strong, more you know, called out in greater detail if, if that would be helpful. But yeah, totally agree with you. Cool. So I think that's good. And we can chat more on the list and strategize going forward. Okay. Um, Chris, did you want to introduce the topic that you wanted to bring up? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> deprecation. Um, uh, this is something that's talk been talked about in the TLS working group quite a lot on and off over time. Um, what is the right time to deprecate like algorithms, uh, versions of the protocol? Um, and each time it comes up, we kind of seem to rehash similar debates over and over again. Um, you know, uh, what is the what is the right amount of deployment for a particular protocol that's necessary to like, turn it off? How do we communicate um, you know, the, the, the deprecation in a way that allows people to transition meaningfully without breaking things? Um, I anticipate or I imagine um, that these topics uh, or these problems are not unique to the TLS working group. Um, other protocols develop, or other working groups develop protocols that may have to be turned off or sunsetted in, in you know, various ways and for various reasons. Maybe like the code to maintain old versions is too complex. Maybe there's our security vulnerabilities or whatever that force us to deprecate things. Um, uh, so I'd like to propose, um, uh, at least for this this particular group, um, it seems relevant to this to to the maintenance of things that we do in the internet um, and the protocols themselves. Uh, that maybe we try to uh, uh, put together some uh, general principles for how you go about deprecating protocols in practice. Um, what are the factors that motivate deprecation? Um, what are you know some best practices to follow for deprecating protocols? How you communicate them? Um, uh, how you communicate those particular things? Um, uh, what, what are yeah, reasonable like what what success criteria looks like I, some things might be like specific to a particular setting like web browsers and usage of tls um but i i'm i'm sure that there's some like general things we can extract from these conversations and you know document them in a way that they would be um useful and uh conversations outside of tls um um this is a bit selfish in a way because i, I kind of uh it'd be nice to be able to just point to something in tls working group and say like we've had this conversation here's some advice to follow go do that um uh, but if it's useful elsewhere, that would be great as well. So I'm curious to hear what people think. Um, I started writing some text on it. Uh, it is not yet in a 00 draft, but um, if there's interest, I can try to push it forward and would welcome contributions from other people. That's it. That's um, the pitch. Thanks. No, that sounds interesting. I have a clarifying question. Um, when you say deprecate a protocol, are you saying um, implementations turn, like no longer speaking the protocol? Or are you saying the IETF marking the protocol as obsolete or historic? Great question. I think both. Um, yeah, like communication uh, it, it, and like marking the protocol as obsolete in, in an IETF publication or whatever, or like, you know, various vendors getting together and saying like, we consider this thing deprecated and we're going to turn it off. Um, that's one aspect of it, but then actually shutting the thing off in implementations is another aspect of deprecation. Um, so I would, I would consider it to be both. Thanks. And uh, I'll maybe even add a third one, which is very related. So at IETF, um, I remember we had one time where someone was presenting about marking IPv4 as deprecated and obsolete. And uh, we... Dan, you beat me to it. I'm in the queue. <laughs> and we kind of laughed about it in the room where I was telling, well, that's cute and all, but like, who cares? Like my laptop is not going to stop, you know, sending DHCP requests because the ITF ivory tower said so. Uh, and I think, you know, discussing that as well, but the way the conversation turned is, which is a very practical and useful one was, 
at some point we say we no longer, the ITF no longer maintains a protocol, which actually helps put it in scope here and no longer works on, let's say, extensions to this. So IPv4 is not at that state yet. We still need to maintain DHCP, for example. But I think you can safely say that in the TLS working group, there are no extensions that are specific to TLS 1.0. In, in fact, we just adopted a, a document that says that TLS 1.2 is frozen. We are no longer going to continue working on these ah, things. So everything is 1.3 moving forward. So yes, I would agree with everything you just said. Cool. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting topic and I'm, uh, I'm interested yeah. in contributing. Great, thanks. I'm glad that you brought up the IPv4 example because I think it's a- Q. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think this is a good idea. Um, so two comments, because uh, you, you said, is it more general? And, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I gave a, I had a list of at least four other examples, and uh, David ninjaed me on one of them. Um, so uh, IGMP v1, um, SNMP v1, um, BGP less than four, where there was a flag day. Um, and then uh, IPv4, it, the, the whole discussion of for to historic, because I think it's useful to have both some success and some failure examples, okay? Um, and not only talk about cases where the IETF did it right, but also talk about learnings from when it came up and it didn't you know, happen or whatever. Um, the closest thing that we have to a normative reference right now, or at least you know, sorry, pre-work, you know, it's informative, is um, RFC 8170 which is an IEB document that I wrote that's planning for protocol adoption and subsequent transitions and the subsequent transitions. And so I would say that's gonna be the start and uh, design it as here's things that we've learned since then and things that, that one didn't cover, right? Because the topic of subsequent transitions, we did talk about this and some of this discussion we did have in the IEB and in the predecessor to this program, right? Um, uh, at the time. And so, but that was 2017. That was like six years ago, or you know, probably seven since it was actually written. And so, we probably have some better examples now that we have, you know, the TLS discussion and so on. So, um, sorry, so, uh, which previous IB program were you talking about? Sorry, which? Uh, so, you said that we had six or seven years ago. Yeah, what was it called? Um, let's see, Stuart, you're on it too. It was the whole, you know, the, the one that dealt with, um, you know, transition at the time. I don't remember. I can't remember the acronym. Uh, uh, no, no worries. It was just because I'm okay. curious to go and find it and read it, but, uh, but I can it, do research. So uh, Yari, I think, was the lead for a little while. I Stack Evolution Program? That's it. Thank you. Stack Evolution. Sorry. Stack Evo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Stack Evo was dealing with that. Right. That's, that was the predecessor to this, to this program. Yeah, I mean, then it was Brian after that. Yeah, right. And so 8170 is a starting point. Uh, look for that, uh, reference it, and then add the deprecation stuff. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think I think it's, it's sort of like the the focus on standardization, like what you want to discontinue working is is one aspect over which uh, the ITF obviously has a lot of control over uh, on what it, what it wants to spend its time on. At least uh, in in theory, in practice, of course, it's a separate story uh, on whether that really works that well. Um, but when it comes to telling don't use impl certain implementations of protocols, I think it gets a little bit tricky. Um, I understand when it, there are some security vulnerabilities uh, that point out that you shouldn't be using it. Um, but then in the DLS case with 1.2, 1.3, it's merely a, a preference, right? Um, it's, it's one that you can use 1.2 in a, in a totally fine way, uh, completely secure. And specifically, when I think about IoT usage, um, like some of the, the stuff is in, used in industrial spaces where you have lifetimes that um, like are crazy long. And so where it's not so easy to just swap out things like uh, in a web browser. And so there's often the, the, the DLS community in particular and, and some other communities, they have very fast moving life cycles, uh, but they tend to forget that there are other industries that are, operate very differently, where it's more difficult to swap out stuff, maybe even requires literally equipment changes. And so I think there's, and, and that's a, in some sense compared to the web and also to the attention in the IT, if it's a niche, but it's, it's not irrelevant. So I, I, 
whatever the, the recommendations say, they may actually want to take that into account as well. Like in this case, deprecating 1.2 work and implementations kind of implicitly means also DTLS 1.2, presumably. Yes. And there's one, one implementation, one commercial implementation of DTLS 1.3 for embedded devices. And uh, that's a little rough, like it was only published last year after all. But. I, I agree that we um, uh, should not sort of project the, the browser perspective on uh, like uh, what this document purports to uh, uh, say. Um, and I don't really, I don't really see it as, you know, describing a, in any normative way, like thou must, uh, you know, turn off things if there's a security vulnerability or whatever. Rather, I kind of view it closer to the style that um, Lucas's draft uh, uses, which is like, here are some considerations that might be relevant for, you know, deprecating things. Um, one of them being like the life cycle and the lifetime of implementations and the difficulty or lack thereof of updating things. So I, I would, I think those things are totally in scope and, and, and if we're to do this, we should be inclusive of um, those very real and, and pragmatic issues that we have to deal with. Encounter security vulnerabilities and would like to uh, get developers and deployment um, sort of service providers to not use certain deployment scenarios, we find it awfully difficult to even remotely figure out on who's using it, uh, the protocol. So um, I know it's like in some groups that may be less of an issue because the community is smaller and there are some big players and you can literally talk to them. But in other environments and a TLS probably belongs to that category, it's impossible to know like who's using it because the deployment, there's such a long tail, it's, it's crazy. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> totally agree. Thank you. Uh, very similar point to my uh, uh, learned friend over there. I don't know your name. But um, and uh, good to see you have the um, consideration of how to communicate that a protocol will be deprecated in there. That is an important thing because as network operator, we're not always. Um, we don't always see some of the subsystem components uh, which which have the minor protocols in the headline protocols. Uh, yeah, fair enough, we all know about those, but some of these smaller minor protocols in subsystems buried down, we may not see. And um, we uh, it can lead to interoperability problems later on, but good to see you have the, you have the, the communication as part of the considerations. Thank you. Two. To add to this, I, I, I think I totally agree with the direction, which is not to mandate any kind of code removal, but more considerations on why you would do it and how to do it safely. And uh, so forgive me, Chris, for bringing up uh, past painful traumatic memories. Um, but like in the case of removing TLS 1.0, um, back when um, Chris was working on that, uh, Turns out that doing it from a browser and doing it from a TLS library are very different beasts. Uh, Cause there's that one email client in a corner that half the company falls over if you remove TLS 1.0, uh, oops. So like, I think, you know, that, that that's kind of not without going to, to the details of that story in the document, but saying like, if you're an application and you know who you're talking to, it's very different from if your library that like someone might use it that you even never heard of. Uh, and, uh, you know, going into Hiram's law and all that um, could be interesting. Yeah, it feels like, Matt Mathis, it feels like there's a, a whole spectrum of ways in which things can be deprecated. And it ends up, it feels to me like the right answer is more like a spreadsheet. And you put a bunch of, start putting X marks in, you shouldn't be shipping this code with new clients. You shouldn't be shipping this code with, with servers. You shouldn't be shipping this code with, and there's a whole progression and different milestones for removing it from clients and removing it from servers, for instance. Um, and there needs to be a separate category as to whether or not you continue to maintain diagnostics. I was to Woodman plus one for what Matt just said, but uh, I wanted to take a slight opposite opinion to, to Hannes's point. Uh, we, to a certain extent, folks are looking to the ITF to be 
prescriptive and descriptive about things. The EU at the moment is worried about cybersecurity and other types of things. And I think one of the problems that Hannes was referring to with embedded devices, which are very difficult to change out, people need to understand the total life cycle cost of their small device and the fact that they're making it cheap at this particular moment in time but they're assuming it's going to stay in operation for 30 years when the cryptographic capabilities of other devices out there and their abilities to crack those things, that, that needs to somehow be forced into the public domain so that purchasers of these things understand that these things are dangerous and depending on where they're operating and what they're doing, um, I don't necessarily care if it's just streaming telemetry or something like that, but if it's involved in two-way conversations and people can get killed, um, those things need to be, I, I think we as a body should be able to take positions and say, we think that this is dangerous. Um, it shouldn't be being used anymore because regulatory institutions will look at what we're saying and some things need to be forced out of the market. Uh, so some, many things should stay in the market, and I don't think we should have an opinion about that, but there must be, we should be aware of the fact that some people would want to force some things out and we might want to take a policy stance and say, this is, we know that this is bad. We've thought about this so that other people then can make the decisions about whether they want to do recalls or anything else like that. But I don't think we should be just entirely silent on that topic. Um, so, so my view is that uh, um, those are good points um, and they matter for specific protocols. And uh, those type of, types of statements come best from like the working groups that maintain those protocols. So for example, when the TLS working group deprecates like TLS 1.0 or 1.1 or specific algorithms in TLS, like that, that, is, that is, um, probably has the desired effect that I think you're after. Um, and uh, whereas like if this program, a document from this little IEB program was to try to say something about any specific protocol, it might not be so useful. So um, I would kind of punt strong positions to, you know, the, the, the sort of the experts that are maintaining those protocols and where those, where they're main, where they're actively developed or, or not. Um, and try to keep this more, agnostic to specific protocols. Uh, agreed. And I was make I was actually commenting about Hamas's thing that we that we quote the IETF should be somewhat more lax. And the answer is it sort of depends. And I'm I'm agreeing with Matt that there needs to be some sort of spreadsheet thing where we think whether we feel like we we care about whether something should be deprecated or yeah. whether it shouldn't, right? Uh, that we think about things associated with security and, and, re and I do agree with you that the working groups are the best place to do that, but I don't think that a higher level opinion that the ITF should be blind to those things should sit on top of that, right? I think the working group should be able to make state relatively harsh statements about things that they think are broken for whatever reasons and that it would be a good idea for people to be trying to recall something. Like, can I discuss SIP protocol in the respect of? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I audible now? <laughs> okay. Can I discuss SIP protocol in, in the regard of deprecation and making something obsolete? Is it okay? Sure. Of course, okay. yeah. So it's a very old protocol and there are so many ways people use SIP and some of them are definitely not the best industry practice. And I've seen people working around it and making their own personal uh, you know, shortcuts. Uh, so is this also a document that says this part or this kind of usage of SIP is now obsolete or deprecated or not supported? No, I don't think this would be the place where we make such re like protocol specific recommendations. I think like if there's a, if there's a, a group within the IETF that maintains SIP or does work that updates SIP, I think that would be the place to do that. It might reference SIP as like an example, but I don't think it should have to take any strong position here on um, what what ship, SIP should or should not do. Or, or, to, or to phrase it differently, this would be a recommendations document saying, here's how you can remove features and here's what you think about when you do, that then 
you could br tell the SIP working group, or I don't know what the name of the working group is, hey, like we should deprecate this feature, look at the recommendations in this generic document, and we should apply them to what we're doing here. And then there would be a new document in SIP saying, okay, we are deprecating X, Y, and Z, and, it'll, and maybe a reference this one as motivation. Does that it, it, make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, that's exactly the intent. Yes. So I, I think the, um, the example was brought up with DLS is, is I think a very good one when it comes to communication uh, because the freezing the work on 1.2, I think for the outside world can be interpreted as we don't think it's a good protocol anymore. Uh, and, and while I understand that there are differences between 1.2 and 1.3, it's, it's one of those cases where it's, there's not a security vulnerability that says you shouldn't be using it like we had with some of the algorithms uh, where you like advances in cryptography have rendered an algorithm sort of less secure. And so I think that's maybe from a messaging point of view also a, a good um, sort of what would be worthwhile a discussion in, in the document itself. Like how do you communicate that outside the world for a protocol that is so widely used in the, in the um, speaking about that sort of maintainability in some of the constraint devices that maybe that's again a separate document uh, that would be worthwhile to write actually think in, in the light of also some of the developments around post quantum crypto and, and presumably many other changes, changes that will follow that how do you actually plan for those type of changes that you obviously cannot anticipate at the time you develop your product. You can't just always assume that you built a gigantic product just in case something in the future may happen. Uh, it's, it's a little bit tricky, right? So I don't know, even know what, what recommendation I would be giving, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Difficult. It's a very tricky job. For example, um, so if you, if you develop a, an IoT product based on a microcontroller today, what do you do in terms of the, the low level keys that you put in there? Would you put some post quantum crypto in there? Like what type of post quantum crypto algorithm would you use? Would you use hash based signatures and then buy into all the problems with the statefulness? Or would you pick one of these not yet finalized uh, uh, algorithms that probably wouldn't fit on the device in the first place where you have little software, no integration into the protocols like what would you actually do? And the, the device is presumably out there in your view, 10 years, most likely 15. Like, I don't know. Thanks. So we're, we're at time and I've closed the queue. Matt, if you want to make a short comment, go ahead right now. I was just going to make a really quick comment that for things like crypto algorithms, it maybe would be necessary to think about them in terms of cost of breaking them. It's like, are you willing to use, a, use an algorithm that takes five cents worth of computing to break it? You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and that's really tricky and it really depends on the, on the use case. So I would personally kind of shy away from this in this document because take, for example, apparently radios for cops only need 32 bits of security. Uh, if people have followed that vulnerability that came out this week or, but in some cases you would say TLS 1.2 is completely insecure because my use case requires the client cert to be encrypted and therefore I need 1.3. And so that's really tricky. All right. But switching, wrapping up with my program lead hat on, uh, clearly there's interest in this. Um, this is a lot of people seem interested. This is an interesting topic. It's, as far as the, the leads think, clearly in scope. So in terms of next step, Chris, are you volunteering to write a dash zero zero? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Awesome, thanks. And send it to the list. And I'm sure a lot of us will be very intrigued to read it and file issues or even provide text. So thanks everyone for the discussion. Thanks for yet another good EDM meeting. Uh, listen to good music and see you at the on the list.
We don't need to send this out now. We can, yeah, let's, we, let's we, we can wait out for the second session yeah, and let's then, then send out both at the same time. Yeah, let's do that. I'm keen. I will. The only people who get to change history is us by what we see the consensus was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That, and I'm just a little bit worried about the, that particular meeting. I'm just worried about that particular meeting that we actually phrased those calls we did on the room correctly. 